Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Vampires. In this video we shall be focusing on Clan Cappadocian. Clan Cappadocian are a clan you may not have heard of. Indeed, if you asked a vampire in the final nights who are Clan Cappadocian, they would probably stare at you agog. Or maybe, if that vampire was an elder, they might say to you, isn't that the name that Clan Giovanni used to be known by? Indeed, that vampire would be correct to a degree. The Clan Giovanni originated as members of Clan Cappadocian, and it was only come the 17th or 16th century, maybe, that the Giovanni dom became to dominate that clan in number, and so the name on the scorecard changed from Cappadocian to Giovanni. No great shakes, always a bunch of death worshippers, and now no more so or no less so uh, than they were several hundred years before. But to just put it like that, to make it sound like it was a subtle takeover of a company, uh, would certainly decrease the impact of the tragedy behind Clan Cappadocian, the horror behind Clan Cappadocian, and the sheer insanity behind Clan Cappadocian. The story starts with a vampire known only as Cappadocius, Cappadocius being one of the third generation, one of the antediluvians, clan founders, Cappadocius was a man or vampire obsessed with death, obsessed with the point of death. What was the point of death? Not just was there a reason behind it, but what was the exact moment where the body died and the spirit passed on to heaven? Indeed, did the body die through brain death? Did the body die through the death of the heart? Did the body die when the soul left the the body. How long could you leave a body after killing a human before going on to embrace it? Cappadocius himself sought the answers to many of these questions and embraced Childer of similar scholarly bent to find out answers to these questions. And some of these questions were answered not just through their scholarly pursuits but also through their discipline of mortis, a discipline a precursor to necromancy, one of the Giovanni's clan disciplines, that focused almost entirely on the human body and the vampire body and its frailties, its weaknesses as well as its strengths and fortitudes. Mortis could decay a body within seconds if a vampire of Clan Cappadocian rested his hand on another vampire's skin it could wither the limb or indeed make it drop off entirely. At the same time, they could summon undead, they could raise dead bodies from the ground and command them as zombies, or they could use their corpse in the monster discipline, where they could take on the strengths and abilities of a corpse. Now, that may not sound like much, but listen to this. Does a corpse feel, fear the sun when feeling its rays? Does a corpse fear true faith from a cross? If you cut a corpse, does it bleed and does it suffer any weaknesses as a result? No. A Cappadocian could do all of these things with just the discipline of mortis as well as inflicting the curse of humanity on other vampires. Maybe rather than giving himself the abilities of a human uh, in order to walk in the sun for a day, the Cappadocian gives that abilities to another vampire, an enemy vampire. That vampire suddenly has human needs. It needs. He needs to eat. He needs to drink. He needs to go to the toilet. He needs to fornicate. These distractions, especially on a vampire of great age, can be incredibly detrimental either in combat, in political situations, or any other uh, event. It's something most vampires are never prepared to experience again. Human needs. And Cappadocians could master this through their mastery of the human body. So not just through Mortis, but their disciplines of all specs, the Seer's ability, the ability to read another vampire's aura, its, its halo, to see what emotions that vampire was thinking. A, a Cappadocian could be telepathic with its ability of all specs. Likewise, the Cappadocians have the discipline of fortitude, the ability to withstand much damage. The Cappadocians put that down to their similarity to a corpse. After all, a corpse takes very little uh, detriment when you bludgeon it over the head or stab it repeatedly. And indeed, 
They resemble the corpse in many ways. The clan Cappadocians' weakness was how they resembled the corpse and could never adopt the blush of life that other vampires could. A vampire of clan Cappadocian could never make the vitae swim around its body to make it look human for just a second. A clan Cappadocian vampires would always look like death. But I am skirting around the history of the clan, for that I must apologise. Cappadocius embraced many child, uh, Caius Coin, Japheth Cappadocius, Lazarus Cappadocius, Cappadocius meaning of Cappadocia, uh, the former name for the lands around Turkey. And uh, of course, Cappadocius also embraced Augustus Giovanni. Now, Cappadocius was a vampire prone to visions. He would sink into torpor often to contemplate what he had discovered on his travels around the known world. And every single time he sank into torpor, he suffered a new vision. And I say suffered because he felt like either the god or the devil was talking to him in his dreams. And this is where the insanity of Clan Cappadocius comes, uh, Clan Cappadocian comes in. Because was Cappadocius really enlightened or was he merely absolutely insane? Whatever the case, one night when he awoke from torpor, raving, he had seen a vision that told him that he must purge his clan. Cappadocius saw a vision that told him that m the vast majority of the members of his clan were not following the scholarly pursuit of death. They were not studying the road of bones. They were not honing their art of mortis. They were not physicians. They were not holy men. They had no connection to death and the study of death in the slightest, and therefore they were left wanting. They should not be vampires. They did not deserve the gift of eternal life. So Cappadocius called all of his child and all of his child as child to him in the underground city of Kaimalki in Turkey, what was Cappadocia, and he addressed them and he put a test to them. He asked them these questions, have you followed the road of bones or have you followed the road of heaven? Uh, are you, do you believe in God? All of these questions and anyone who could answer in the negative had to walk into Kaimalki. They did not know what awaited them in there, but unfortunately for them it was a fate most foul, as Cappadocius sealed Kaimalki behind them with a mystical ward that said, May no child of Seth ever enter, and no, may no child of Cain ever leave. What this basically meant was that any vampires who had entered Kaimalki could never again leave. They were entombed, and very quickly indeed they had to fall upon each other. There was no food within Kaimalki, no mortals to drink upon, just other vampires. These vampires, many of them not realising why they had been why they had been found wanting, they were confused, they felt betrayed by their clan, and all they could do was resort to diablery, all they could do was resort to drinking from one another because it was the only food source available to them. Some of them sunk into torpor, hoping for a night when the ward may fail. Some of them, with great powers of necromancy, were able to enter the Shadowlands where the wraiths dwell, but whatever happens to them is a mystery for another night. The vast majority of the vampires entombed in Kaimalki diablerized one another, or ran out of blood to the point of final death. And thus was one of the great tragedies of Clan Cappadocian. One of Cappadocius's child, a Lazarus Cappadocius, he had sought the mysteries of death in ancient Egypt. He had been to the pyramids, he had been to the land of Duat as far as he was concerned. He was in the correct land of death and he was the closest to solving the mysteries of death. For some reason Cappadocius did not feel the same and so he sent his child Caius Coin out to bring Lazarus to Kaimalki for the Great Purge. Lazarus, of course, was already aware of this, being a master of all specs and having various spies within the clan, and he told Caius pretty much where to stick his offer of Kaimalki and eternal <laughs> entombment. There was a great battle. Not only was were great powers of Mortis flung back and forth during this battle on the sands, but Lazarus exhibited the powers of Serpentis, the clan discipline of, discipline of the followers of Set. So perhaps Cappadocius was right, maybe Lazarus had fallen off the path, but all that is known of the conclusion is that Caius was destroyed and Lazarus sunk into torpor, leaving his child of the Lazarines to follow on his path. 
his particular part of the road of bones and again whatever happened to them is down to myth and legend from that point on. I mentioned Augustus Giovanni before, a Venetian necromancer and merchant who had been embraced by Cappadocius some hundred years before the great entombment, if that is a word. Augustus Giovanni did not like what had happened. He felt that if any member of Clan Cappadocian could be entombed, surely the Giovanni were just as at risk. So he called his child to him, just as Cappadocius had called his child to him. And Augustus Giovanni told them that this would not do, that there would have to be a way out, that the ascendancy of the Giovanni was at hand, that they had refined the discipline of mortis to the point where it dealt with the spirit only, the discipline of necromancy, in some vampires' eyes a far superior discipline, indeed to some Cappadocians a far superior discipline. Whatever the case, and maybe it wasn't that, maybe it wasn't that the Giovanni was scared by the purge, maybe Augustus Giovanni always had diablerie in his heart, for he was embraced not just for his knowledge of death and death magics, but also for his immense greed. And some say he chose his sire. He had been approached by both Toreador and Ventru before Cappadocius, and he was just waiting for the right vampire to find him for the embrace, and he knew that Cappadocius was a powerful, and so he accepted the brace from the Antediluvian, knowing that it brought him closer to the progenitor of the vampire line. And maybe he always intended to diabolise Cappadocius. Maybe he wasn't scared into it. Maybe it was always his plan. But whatever the case, in the year of our Lord, 1444, Clan Giovanni began to purge the Cappadocians, just as the Cappadocians had done to their own number. They slowly but steadily managed to pick off members of that incredibly fractured clan, Cappadocian. Maybe they wouldn't have been so fractured had Cappadocius not already entombed a number of his own child. It is difficult to say, but the Giovanni, a unified group, smashed the splintered number of the Cappadocians. Even Cappadocius himself fell before Augustus Giovanni, who diabolized his sire. Some say that Augustus Giovanni was not able to drink Cappadocius' soul, or maybe the last remnants of his vitae, but who can say? Because Augustus Giovanni certainly seemed to exhibit the powers of an antediluvian from that point on. Japheth Cappadocius was either diabolized or disappeared. Lazarus never rose again, or at least not until the final night. And Cappadocians fell by the score, by the hundred, across Europe, across the Middle East, maybe even across Asia and North Africa, until... There were no Cappadocians, no vampires were left of Clan Cappadocian, just members of Clan Giovanni who had stolen all of the secrets, all of the scholarly works of their forebearers. They had taken the clan, and Clan Cappadocian became Clan Giovanni, and to this night not one Cappadocian remains, or so the Giovanni would have you believe. Just as the Tremere's utter annihilation of Clan Salubri could be seen as dubious, so is the utter annihilation of Clan Cappadocian. For after all, the bloodline known as the Samadhi certainly resemble corpses to a great degree, although to a vastly worse decomposition state than Clan Cappadocian ever did. And what of the harbingers of the skulls, who call themselves Lazarines and have recently appeared and joined the Sabbat, and call the Giovanni their mortal and immortal enemies? Who are they, and where do they originate? And what of the talk of the Emla Watu, a, an African bloodline who dwells within the Ebony Kingdom, uh, who also strongly resemble the Cappadocians of days and nights gone by? One of the mysteries of the Masquerade. Does Clan Cappadocian still exist as anything other than a relic? As anything other than the precursors to Clan Giovanni? Well... That's entirely down to the storyteller to decide. Thank you very much for watching.